Thank you very much, uh, Anil, and welcome to this uh, panel discussion on China shifting geopolitics and the global economy. My name is Ramesh Feitelingham. I'm an uh, economics writer and uh, communication consultant. Among other things, I work with Anil and Christian and the uh, US, European and finance um, panels that we ask these questions to that Anil was just explaining. We've uh, got a fantastic um, panel of uh, speakers uh, to talk to you tonight. Um, let me quickly introduce them. Um, to my immediate left is uh, uh, Keiu Jin, who is uh, a professor of economics at the London School of Economics and author of a book called, uh, just recently published, called The New China Playbook Beyond Socialism and Capitalism. Unfortunately, I don't have a copy of it to wave around, but uh, um, I just wanted to give that a little bit of a plug because we've got all scholars here and they're, not, they're, they're, they're quite shy about coming forward about, uh, about their books that they would like to uh, publicize. Uh, next to uh, Keiu is uh, Sergei Guriev, who is uh, former chief economist at the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development, former rector of the New School in Moscow, and currently provost at uh, Sciences Po in Paris. And he is author of another recent book, which I do have a copy to wave around, which is called Spin Dictators, The Changing Face of Tyranny in the 21st Century. Um, our our um, third panelist is uh, Beata Yevorczyk, who is the current chief economist at the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development, and also a professor of economics at um, the University of Oxford. Um, Beata hasn't written a book, but she has masterminded the uh, EBRD's annual transition report, Business Unusual, which covers some of the uh, things that we're gonna be talking about today. And both Beata and uh, Sergey are members of our European uh, panel of experts who we poll regularly on um, big, big policy questions. So the format is gonna be, um, we're gonna not have any speeches, not gonna have any slides, we're just gonna have a conversation. Each of our um, speakers is gonna kick off with around five minutes of, of remarks, then we'll have some conversation around the panel for 30 minutes or so, and then I'll open it up to the floor uh, for questions. We wanna make this as much of a, a conversation as possible. Um, okay, let's, uh, let's start off. Um, we're gonna start with shifting geopolitics, and I've asked Sergey to give us a little bit of background of uh, how he sees these things, that are, the things that have happened over the last three or four years. Sergey, over to you. Thank you very much, uh, Ramesh. Uh... The way we think about shifting geopolitics is probably we need to go back, say, five years, and we look at market prices and we ask which geopolitical risks are priced in and which are not. And if you go back five years and now uh, look into 2023, you will see lots of things which have not been priced in. And the two biggest things are, of course, COVID and the war, the full scale invasion uh, by Russia of Ukraine uh, in 2022, which is still continuing. Now this, uh, oh, okay. So um, it works. Uh, <laughs> but I'm not going to repeat myself. Uh, basically, uh, the book. So whenever I speak, I need to speak about the book because I have a co-author and a publisher who forced me to do that. But uh, the book is exactly about this: how we think about today's competition between democratic and non-democratic regimes. And the book talks about kinds of non-democratic regimes which pretend to be democracies. So this line between democratic and non-democratic regimes is becoming harder to define, but there are non-democratic regimes which are proud to be non-democratic and China is one of them. China has a multi-party system. People don't know about that. China has different parties, but uh, one party always wins. Uh, the other party is supported. And China is pretty, pretty open about what it does as a political system. Russia until 2022, was a typical spin dictatorship, a, a, a system which pretended to, to have some independent media, some opposition parties, uh, some elections. I wanted to be uh, pretending that it is a democracy and actually majority of regimes today are like this. Now, uh, before COVID and before, um, before the 2022 war, people would actually be asking questions if non-democratic regimes are doing better than democratic regimes. And now several things which we've seen in the last five years have su suggested that um, there are different shocks, different geopolitical risks that have materialized, which we didn't expect. And now before, before those events, people would ask a question, how come China is growing so fast? How come Chinese uh, government doesn't make mistakes? 
And uh, some people would respond, well, China has borrowed certain institutional fixes to non-democratic system that allow it to work reasonably well. A re regular rotation of uh, top management, uh, meritocracy, so you promote people who do well at the regional level. Uh, and then people would ask, how, how long can it continue given that somebody at the top will eventually say, I don't want to step down after 10 years. It's a good job. I can actually continue doing that. And po political scientists would ask the question, why? Why would uh, somebody actually step down? And, and the answer would be people still remember Mao, and Mao has not done a good job in terms of neither economics nor politics for people around him. And so, and so once uh, that uh, an, 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 an problematic experience was forgotten, we see that uh, China is moving closer to a personalistic dictatorship, uh, avoiding those um, uh, institutional fixes that allowed it to grow faster. And now this is where we start seeing mistakes made by autocratic regimes. Now in autocratic regimes, mistakes are a feature and not a bug. And uh, my co-author actually wrote a paper, um, Dan Trisman wrote a paper called Democratization by Mistake. He actually shows that lots of dictators make very important mistakes. And again, this is also not surprising given that dictators lack feedback, they don't have free media, they don't have political opposition or civil society that provides critical uh, feedback that allows to correct mistakes. And this is what we saw both in China during COVID, a zero COVID policy at times looked like a very smart decision, at times it looked, uh, looked a very painful mistake. And we also saw that in Russia. Again, people said Putin is doing very well, uh, maybe economy is not growing, but control of Putin over the society, over political system is actually quite solid. And we saw that in 2022, Putin has made a major mistake. I, I, I think uh, we'll talk about that in questions and answers, but basically Putin's plan was to replay 2014. He thought that, uh, well, it worked for me, economy was slowing down, but I annexed Crimea and my popularity went up dramatically by 20 or 30 percentage points. So he wanted to do the same in 2022, but he made a mistake. He underestimated Ukrainian resistance. He underestimated the resolve and unity of the West and he overestimated his own, own army. And that's again a, a feature rather than a bug. Now, where does it leave us? We still have the share of global GDP produced by non-democratic regimes which is much higher than 20 years ago, 40 years ago. Depending on how you count, and most importantly, whether you count India as a democracy or non-democracy, that's actually a very interesting question. But some political scientists already think that uh, India is not a democracy. So depending on this, you get about 40% of global GDP in nominal terms produced by non-democratic regimes. And that's, uh, if you go back 30 years, the number has grown something like from 20% to 40%. It's a big, big difference. Does that mean that uh, the West is losing, the democratic model is falling apart? Well, that is not clear because democratizations come in waves and uh, the waves of democratizations actually take place when we see major failures on non -democratic, of non-democratic regimes. And uh, we don't see that China is falling apart. This is what uh, we are going to talk about, but we definitely see that Russia has made a major mistake and destroyed its economy. So in that sense, there is more optimism today that uh, Western model, democratic model, uh, market-based uh, economy with liberal political institutions might actually be doing that, doing better, sorry, than we thought just five years ago. Uh, this battle will continue and the world is not going to be much safer this year or next year. And it's definitely going to be much less safe than five, uh, five, five years ago. Uh, but at least uh, recent events uh, in, uh, in a non-democratic part of the world have shown that non-democracies are not perfect. They make horrible mistakes and that creates some, uh, uh, some ground for optimism. I'll stop here. One, one quick follow-up question, Sergey. Um, you, you talked about two events that weren't priced in, one being the COVID pandemic, which I think we, none of us saw coming, but the Russian invasion, perhaps you, you might've seen coming. Were, were you surprised that, um, that Putin launched a full-scale invasion in that way? Um, I was surprised. I, I was not already surprised uh, on the day of the invasion or a week before. That was clear that it's coming. But uh, a month before, everybody had doubts. A year before, nobody thought it's possible. 
And part of that is indeed this, this, this is actually connected to COVID. Putin spent two years in isolation and uh, he didn't talk to many people. He didn't talk to busy people. If uh, you're a business executive, you have other things to do than stay for a couple of weeks in lockdown before you can see Putin, right? That was the mode of operation of Putin. So the smartest and busiest people were doing something else and he was talking to people who had nothing else to do but to talk to Putin. And so uh, his feedback loop was very, very limited. And so, and so in that sense, uh, he grew increasingly uninformed about, as I said, what's happening in the West, what's happening in his own army, uh, the attitudes in Ukraine. He was told Ukrainians will greet him with flowers. And so, because he spent a lot of money on this, he sent a lot of money to his agents in Ukraine. And he didn't know that they spent it in London or in Zurich, right? And these people also spend it in London and Zurich because they knew well, the war is not going to happen. So nobody would check how they spend this money. And uh, and this is this is the problem of non-democratic regime, you don't have enough feedback, you don't have enough uh, information on how the system is functioning. But uh, about a week before or two weeks before, it was already clear it's, it's going to happen. But I should tell you, uh, I, I wrote an op-ed in Financial Times in January, and I said, uh, uh, sanctions will be devastating, but I, I wouldn't imagine sanctions like this as well. So that the, on the third day of, this, of the war, uh, the West uh, sanctioned Russian Central Bank and its reserves. And then I would be surprised that, well, even with the sanctions like this, Russia would be able to function. And this is where, again, we look at the world that has changed dramatically, most importantly, with China serving as a reliable partner of Putin so far. China is not supplying weapons, but if China sanctioned Russia, Russia would not be able to fall. Thank you. Well, let, let's turn now di directly to China. Um, Kay, you, you were born and brought up in, uh, in China. You, you came and studied in, in, uh, in the West and you're, you're teaching here in London. But you're, you spend a lot of time back there and, you're, and your, your book is really an insider's look at uh, what's going on in the Chinese economy. Why don't you give us a, a feel for that? I'll give you a feel about uh, the Chinese current economic circumstances and what it means for the world. Um, in short, um, serious challenges. Uh, you have, you know, the slowest growth in 40 years, youth unemployment uh, way above 25 percent, 100 trillion RMB of debt uh, and, uh, you know, stock market, financial system and so forth. FDI in China has totally plunged. Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, income growth is also um, is also slowing down, if not deteriorating. And you have real estate sector uh, that is um, uh, strongly contracting. Uh, I think currently um, there's a, a serious lack of confidence in China. It's a demand problem in China. China didn't have the kind of large stimulus packages that Europe and US saw during the pandemic and it was last to exit uh, the pandemic um, and plus the real estate investment uh, drag, et cetera, has really hurt consumer confidence and uh, hence the, the economic malaise. Um, but, you know, as we see in the press, there's lots of stories, theories about China, Japanification, peak China, demographic, aging, China's growth is over, uh, China's never going to overtake the U.S. in terms of GDP size. And I don't think that's the right way to look at it. Uh, I think one thing we've got to ask is, is this really cyclical or structural? Is it really two bad quarters of uh, GDP growth? Does it really herald a permanent decline? I'd actually uh, argue that in the last 40 years of Chinese growth, there have been too few bust years so that there have been lots of low productivity companies, zombie companies surviving, no exit mechanism whatsoever. If you look at the stock market, 1% uh, exit for, you know, for delisting um, for, for uh, bad companies, SOE staying around, and now that playbook is over. Um, the economic cycles, the recession that's happening is really uh, uh, you know, making lots of companies go bust. Um, so that's the flip side of the argument. But, um, I think if we go back to first principles, there are some really fundamental factors that are way more important than the demographic aging that's looming or uh, the, the asset price drop, uh, which is incomparable to Japan in the 1990s, which is, first of all, you have about 960 million people who are living under $300 per month. They have not reached middle income by international standards. You have 176 million migrant workers 
who you know having had the same having now had the same income as an urban average urgent urban resident spends only a third of the consumption levels because they don't have social protection urban rights now if you gave them that that unleashes at least another trillion rmb of additional consumption per year so before we talk about demographics and the 0.5 percentage decline in labor force growth into the future you know we want to think about this 1 billion uh, people uh and even compared to japan china's urbanization rate is still 10 percentage points below Japan's level before it, um, it saw that asset price uh, collapse. Uh, equally important uh, when uh, economies like Japan, Korea, Taiwan really leveled off their growth, their TFP total factor productivity uh, level share of the US was already at 80, 85%. China's around 20% or 40% by purchasing power parity measures. So significant gap. If you look at the service industry, you know, 50% of GDP compared to 80% uh, in, in, the, uh, in advanced economies. So the list goes on. Uh, but I think the most important thing to, to, to note is the fact that you have the first time in history and a, a developing country with only a quarter of living standards, advanced economies, being able to do cutting edge technology. I think that's way more significant than the cyclical uh, features today. Um, Australian output, uh, research output earlier this year said, at least in terms of research and cutting edge technologies, 35 out of 44 are led by China ahead of the US. Uh, the, the new phone by Huawei defying US sanctions and so forth with the seven nanometer chips, again, defying US sanctions. I think this is only a really a beginning. And I think it goes to show that whether these technological restrictions as we're seeing, I think that's really the tidal wave of geopolitical shifts is really useful or it's gonna be leaky. And in fact, the reaction is that it has mobilized a whole concerted national program, uh, whether it's the big techs like Alibaba, Huawei, Tencent, all doing chips and uh, AI and so forth and linking with industries, national labs, university, et cetera, uh, really mobilizing before they were comfortably importing chips. I think US is 36% um, of US uh, chips goes to China. Now it's no longer the case. The semiconductors company have seen six times uh, uh, profit increases in the last year. Um, that just goes to show. I, I want to put out, the, raise the question: you know, whether these kind of technological uh, a rivalry or these restrictions will work. But finally, I think what we should also consider. I think it's a murky picture in terms of what it means for globalization. Because on the one hand, you do see FDI dropping in China. China's share of greenfield FDI in the world also shrinking, deteriorating by a significant uh, um, number, even though its GDP share is rising. Um, and I think we're on a downward trend for US-China trade uh, structural changes, although I think some of that is just being rerouted through countries like Vietnam and Mexico. Um, investments totally drop. So I think you know we, we do see some very negative and as adverse pictures. On the other hand, you know China's uh, dominance in the uh, new energy sector, um, uh, production, you know, production share of major uh, new energy sectors is really huge. Uh, rare earth materials, etc., also suggests that the economies are still very tightly linked. Well, well let, let's come back to those issues around possible deglobalization and and, and uh, technology and energy issues. Just just following up what Sergey's point about the link between autocracy and economic performance. That's that's some some of the the commentators who are bears on on China right now are are saying. The issue is around autocracy, potentially greater autocracy now than, than, than uh, previously during China's growth period. I'm not sure I completely. I'm not sure I completely agree. I think where I would agree is I think um, the information flows uh, are are more limited than they are, they were before a few years before in China. I'd agree that the political economy model, which was very powerful. In the past, the local officials, local government having huge resources coming from real estate undertake major economic programs, reforms, and technology and environment and so forth is now weaker because of the heavy debt that's been involved. And I do agree with the fact that political incentives and behavior, government behavior, have seen a change because it's more about political loyalty than economic performance, which dominated the last 40 years. So this is what I agree in terms of the political reasons behind economic uh, challenges in China. 
Um, but I'm not sure I agree that there's an existential, you know, difference between these countries because when pu push comes to shove, you know, when they need to be pragmatic, the Chinese team will be pragmatic. And we're seeing a shift towards that kind of pragmatism. If the economy tanks further, there will be greater transparency. And in fact, actually, there is greater transparency with now with the need to reveal the local government debt levels and the real estate data. So it's not clear, at least in the case of China, that you know it's a dictator uh, uh, model versus another. I think it's just a, an accommodation to reality. Great, thank you, Beata. Let's 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 turn to you. Um, we've uh, uh, Kate has just mentioned U.S. Uh, China difficulties there. I think we're all familiar with 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 the with the uh, the tensions there that have started under the Trump regime, particularly and have continued under under Biden. You want to talk a little bit about Europe and the European attitudes towards uh, China? Can you give us a perspective on that? Well, thank you so much. Uh, can you hear me? Oh. Yeah. Um, so let me focus on three trends related to international trade. The first one is that I fear that the world is on a path to fragmentation. Ramesh mentioned the US-China tensions, the trade war. Um, the European response to that was initially strategic autonomy. Um, which was about de-risking, which was about um, preventing countries from weaponizing trade, securing access to critical raw materials. But now I fear that the debate in Brussels has changed and that Europe is aligning with the US in terms of its policy on China. Um, there, is, there are discussions about limiting European flows of European technology to China um, about screening inward and outward FDI. And I fear that politics is trumping economic considerations and that this process cannot be stopped. And businesses um, seem to have accepted that, that we are on a path to decoupling and they are essentially trying to mitigate the cost. Now, is this a good idea? Any trade economist would tell you it's not. In the report Ramesh was uh, waving here, uh, we asked the question, what if? What if the world were to break into two blocks and the trade cost between two blocks increased by 20%? Well, what would happen? The answer is pretty much everyone would lose. And the countries that would lose most would be the countries that had ties uh, to economies that would find themselves in two blocks. Now, the second trend is related uh, to sanctions um, that were imposed on Russia after its invasion of Ukraine. <coughs> These sanctions led to profound changes in trade. So European exports to Russia dropped dramatically. However, we see an increase in European exports to Central Asian and Caucasus economies, and in turn, those countries export more to Russia. And this roundabout trade is conducted particularly enthusiastically in goods that are subject to European sanctions. Now, of course, the scale of this roundabout trade is small. The replacement rate on average is about 10%. However, in some particular products, the replacement rate is much higher. As European exports to Russia dried out, countries such as China, uh, Turkey, increased their exports. And they are, they are not party to sanctions and they are trading in products that Europe was uh, initially uh, or originally sending um, to Russia. The third trend is related um, to currencies used to invoice trade transactions. Um, there has been if you consider Russian imports, you see that there has been a big change in the composition of uh, currencies in which this trade is denominated. Why a few years ago, only you know, two, 3% of Chinese trade to Russia was denominated in Yuan. By now it's two thirds. And if you look at shares, this increase in reliance on Yuan is coming at the expense of the US dollar. Moreover, you see that countries such as India, Turkey, United Arab Emirates are sending exports to Russia denominated in their own currencies. And third countries, 
are using uh, yuan as the currency of invoicing. In particular, this is done by countries that have swap lines with the People's Bank of China and countries that are not party uh, to sanctions. So while the dominance, while the dollar dominance has made sanctions more effective, um, the sanctions may contribute to actually erosion of US dollars dominance in the long run. Tell us a little, little bit more about your, your perspective on this, this process of deglobalization. I mean, is, is, is this just a, 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 something that's happening as a result of the pandemic, as a result of um, the, the, the uh, Russian invasion of Ukraine, um, impact on supply chains of these kind of things? Is, is, is that something that's just cyclical in a way, or is, is that something that you could see persisting into in the longer term? Well, so it, it started out with the discontent of American workers displaced by uh, imports from China. It was fueled by the US-China rivalry. It, it culminated initially in the US-China trade war, which was fought outside of the World Trade Organization. And initially, this was perceived in Europe as an aberration, as something that was specific to Trump administration. But the US administration changed the tariffs remained in place. Um, I think what, has, what was the game changer was the war and renewed focus, which forced uh, greater emphasis on, on geopolitics. And I think some understanding in Europe that US leadership is needed um, to deal with um, the conflict with the war on, on the European continent. And I think that is what's fueling this alignment of, of Europe um, with, with the US. And what of the, what of the World Trade Organization? I mean, the US has, has largely uh, give, given up on that, it seems. So, so the US was a co-creator. It was, uh, you know, it initially was very supportive of the global trading rule. By now, you, the US seems to have lost interest. Um, in the WTO, um, one, you know, US blocked the uh, nominations of judges to the appellate panel in the, the, in the dispute settlement body, uh, which essentially made this body uh, dysfunctional. Um, while Europe initially was trying to, you know, create an alternative system, and initially I think Europe was much more multilateralist in its approach, I think by now, um, the focus has shifted and there is much more emphasis on preferential trade agreements. And I think the WTO seems to have um, lost in its in importance. And I think that's, that's a great pity because I think, uh, you know, it is an organization that safeguards the rules of the game. And once it is deemed completely ineffective, it will become a free for all any country will be able to raise its tariffs or subsidies uh, because there will be no mechanism to, to discipline, to, to enforce the rules. Okay, what, 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 what do you think would be the, the Chinese view on, on, on deglobalization? Well, uh, um, it, it is also um, more complex, right? On the one hand, China's view, China's vision with the world is very much greater uh, engagement. And rather than just autocracy versus democracy, I would say the West versus the South. And you know, China is engagement and uh, with the global South, um, pushing towards more cooperation, collaboration, also more regionalization. Of Things trade. like the Belt and Road Initiative that's well, ten Road years is, old. Is, now. Yes, pass, uh, but <laughs> uh, but but new lots of new initiatives, yeah. uh, including you know blocks, bricks that want to uh, create parallel system to the SWIFT and then potentially alternatives to the dollar, et cetera, uh, uh, not to mention the trading uh, agreements, especially in, 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 um, in Asia. And obviously China as a part of that BRICS block want to exert or greater influence on global rules and norms. And uh, China's uh, view for itself is to be a very central component of the global supply chain but much more higher value added. And I think there are some recent data that showed that um, uh, China's role in terms of R&D intensive sectors have shot up. Uh, and I think it's even overtaken the US. Um, so, uh, that, so there is a sense of that kind of openness uh, in trade and investment. 
Um, but on the other hand, um, there is the issue about self-reliance on critical components. And one, one, you know, one is the global theme of diversification. Another is um, uh, the fact that the U.S. restrictions and then potentially a block against China on some of the critical components uh, it leaves it no choice but to, to pursue more uh, self-reliance. And also recently, uh, global uh, demand has been quite weak. So there is a slight shift towards emphasis on relying on internal demand, uh, consumption led, if it's um, uh, feasible to do so, uh, rather than rely on exports. So I think it's kind of, it's not really necessarily a contradiction of at the same time, still pushing for a global engagement, but also turning more inward economically. All right. Let, let, let's, um talk a little bit about the, the green transition, and which, which ties in, I think, with, with some of the issues around energy markets that are thrown up by the, the wall. So again, do, do you want to pick, pick that up and uh, give us a, a sense of how, how you think about that? Yes, um, I think uh, this is the fundamental challenge uh, for the world. And uh, we saw that in recent years, uh, the world started to um, wake up to the fact that it's not just a scientific consensus, but something which is happening in front of our eyes. This is also something that people would not price in, that green parties are doing so well in elections. We'll see what happens in European elections next year. But uh, there is definitely a change in the sense that um, now with, with each summer getting hotter and hotter, people started to pay attention. And uh, no longer just young people who care about what's going to happen to the planet, but also uh, middle-aged people start thinking maybe it will hit me as well because it's happening in front of my eyes. And this is a new political reality where indeed uh, there is more and more investment, sometimes in violation of WTO, like in the Inflation Reduction Act. Uh, but we see acceleration of, um, of attention being paid and we see more specific, more concrete uh, initiatives. That said, we suddenly face the reality that it's going to be expensive. And uh, suddenly when we seriously take the green transition, we suddenly discover that uh, somebody has to pay for this and not everybody's happy to pay. And uh, this is uh, um, something that is very, very tangible in many, many uh, countries which want to accelerate green transition. This country is now rethinking its, uh, uh, its uh, green objectives. Uh, France has seen the Yellow Vest uh, appraisal, which had many reasons, but the trigger was a fuel tax <clears throat> promised by Macron, who won an election with that promise. And then people discovered that it's a very unjust tax. Uh, me living in Paris using electric public transportation paid by the state, subsidized by the state, I benefit from green transition. Uh, people who live in rural areas and drive diesel cars to work, paying extra for green transition suddenly said it's unfair. And so, and so this, these things are extremely complex, but again, to uh, add an optimistic uh, spin, we saw a very fast transformation of certain European countries in 2022. So again, Think about Germany. Germany had something like 40% of its imported gas coming from Russia. Now the share is zero. Uh, Germany just in one year got rid of Russian gas, oil, and coal. And this is something which is doable really quickly as we discovered. And that also will accelerate, will accelerate uh, the switch to probably initially to natural gas and nuclear, but eventually to renewables. Now, uh, uh, as uh, I think it was Donald Rumsfeld who said that uh, our Lord has given oil to countries which have different uh, geopolitical uh, values, something like this. This is not exactly true. U.S. is the biggest producer of oil and gas now. It just doesn't export it that much because it consumes uh, oil for other industries. But yet, uh, this is also going to be part of geopolitics. And each war, like we saw in 2022 and 2023, will provide additional impetus to move from hydrocarbons to renewables. And that, that is kind of the silver lining that we observed in, 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 recent, in recent years. So I'm, I'm becoming more optimistic, but though I would say that once we move from talk to delivery, we suddenly discover how expensive it is and how sometimes it is difficult from political 
uh, economy point of view. So uh, there are there are there are certain things which we've learned in recent years on this, and some of those things were were not really priced in. Beata, what's what's your view or, or the EBRD house view, whichever you care to? So. I think this fragment, the process of fragmentation of the global economy does not augur well for the green transition. Um, if you recall, US restrictions on technology transfer to China were met with Chinese uh, restrictions on exports of germanium and gallium. These are two uh, minerals that are needed for chip production and China controls more than 90% of production of those. Um, in the forthcoming transition report, which we will um, launch on, in November, uh, we have looked at uh, who controls productions of production of various minerals. And we split the world into two blocks, Western block versus um, the rest, uh, essentially along the lines of the UN voting or condemning um, Russian invasion of Ukraine. And you know, there are minerals um, that are needed for green transition that are in the controlled majority of whose production is controlled by the non-Western bloc. Uh, so this would be rare earth, this would be platinum. And you know, I fear that if the tensions between now Europe and, and China, for instance, escalate, Europe may find itself cut off from supply of critical raw materials before it has had time to develop alternative supplies. And you know, while a few years ago only 5% of exports of critical raw materials were under some form of restrictions globally, now it's 30%. Uh, and on top of that, you know, if tensions escalate, um, it will be much more difficult to secure global cooperation. And you know, at the end of the day, um, dealing with climate emergency is about public goods and we need a global solution to a global problem. I'm gonna to come to the audience in just a second. So get, do, please get your questions uh, ready. But Kay, can I ask you about, about this issue um, and what, what China is doing in, the, in, the, in this area? I mean, we, we know that China is very dominant in electric vehicles. Um, <laughs> Christian Lloyds uh, showed us a uh, chart earlier in the day in, in, our, in our conference showing the amazing um, change that China's had on in air pollution, reducing air pollution. We're saying, could, could, could something similar happen with, uh, with climate change? Um, I, I'd say the flip side of what Beata was saying is that this is really the only main area of international collaboration that's possible, especially between US and China. Right. And that's what they're talking about, you know, separating competition from collaboration and climate mm -hmm. change is really the most important thing. And I think China has definitely signed up to it because it is front and center for the Chinese leadership, uh, uh, climate change, green energy, et cetera, green transition. Um, uh, you know, China does what, like invest, uh, accounts for a third of renewable investments uh, globally, uh, dominates in sectors 90%, or sorry, 80% of solar panels, 40% of wind turbines, and 90% of this critical minerals important for EV batteries, et cetera. And within 10 years, China became the largest consumer and producer of, of uh, electric vehicles. And again, it's using that political economy model, which is really state mobilization that can be very powerful to really roll out 4 million EV charging stations around the country as opposed to 170,000 in the US, right? So that really matters. And if China's committed to that, then uh, it will be done. Uh, I think there's a cost issue. I think as a characteristic of China's uh, growth model, it's high cost, high growth, and it's very costly. I'm not sure it's sustainable. Um, but it is uh, part of the most important uh, policy parameters. Uh, and um, yeah, I think, I, think, I think that is actually, I, I do give more hope uh, to greater collaboration on this front. Great, thank you. Plenty of time for questions. Um, so if you could, um, when I call you, uh, there are some roving mics around the place. Um, let's see, there's, there's one down here at the front. Um, second row here. Um, I'll, 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 come, I'll come to you in, in, in due course. So let's start off with this one. If you could just say who you are, what your affiliation is, if there's someone particularly you're targeting your, your question at, and questions, not statements, please. I have done this before. My name is Sofia Matveva, and I'm a proud graduate of this institution. And my question is to Kyo Jin. I 
really found what you're saying very interesting and we'd love to hear more from you. Um, tell us about TikTok. So how is the potential ban seen by the Chinese government, but also by Chinese big tech? And I hope we don't ban it here because I love it. <laughs> um, I think, sorry, sure, should, I, should yeah, I go ahead? Yeah. yeah. I guess one interesting fact is, despite everything that's happening between US and China, four out of the five most downloaded apps are Chinese in the US. Apart from TikTok, there's a fashion brand, there's a, you know, Timu, and I forgot the fourth one. Uh, so that goes to show that practically, you know, Chinese business models are being replicated around the world and they are globally dominant. Chinese people don't care so much about what's happening in the U.S., uh, less than U.S. assumes, uh, because TikTok, the bite, bite dance, um, is really, really big in China, and that's what they're most uh, concerned about. Uh, so, um, but I think more generally, uh, other than TikTok, Chinese view this technological restrictions and what's happened to Huawei and these uh, um, the U.S. truculence, if you will, with great amount of emotions. Uh, uh, so I think that's the natural response. Uh, thank you. Uh, I'm actually current uh, EMBA student, um, current based in Hong Kong. I actually have can I have two questions uh, for Dr. Professor Jin, please. Uh, I, I think I agree with you. Like people, uh, I think probably what my first question goes to like people worry about the current China slowdown is more like structural. Um, but I personally think I never, you know, underestimate Chinese government willingness and capacity to really stimulate economic growth again. But I think one question I have for you is that, what do you think? Because China has been rolling out a lot of like um, stimulus this year. You can say that it's not a bazooka style all, all out kind of stimulus plan, but they have been doing something for consumption, for property, for, for the financial stability. Um, but to your, in your view, what else can they do? Like, because uh, I think one, one thing we worry about is like, basically they're running off ammo already. Like whatever they're gonna bring out is probably uh, the last resort is going to be a very large scale liquid injection into the Chinese economy, which is not really the top leadership uh, really wants for China. So I think it's my first question. That, that, that'll do. That, that, thank you. There's, there's, <laughs> there's, there's, there's plenty of other people. Can, can you hand the mic to the gentleman just in front of you? And why, can you, why don't you take that? Uh, and then we've got a question here. So just, Richard. just uh, yeah. yeah in can, can you take that one and then, okay. and then uh, Richard's question? Um, uh, stimulus, yes, way below expected for a few reasons, rightly or wrongly. Uh, Chinese government believes that you need a really massive stimulus to have any effect on the economy, not like 2009 with 4 trillion RMB turned to 40 trillion RMB. Part of the reason is the financial system, the credit just gets stuck there. It's not very effective. And again, rightly or wrongly, they believe that this, um, the stimulus, unlike in the West, will not be effective for short-term demand kind of stimulus. And instead, they should harness the resources for hard tech and high tech. Again, we might disagree. And finally, uh, the concerns for financial stability. I think that's the main reasoning. So we should expect that, and again, this is subject to change every single month, that they are doing something to prevent a hard landing of real estate and the economy, but potentially not much more. But that will be adjusted as, you know, as data uh, reveals itself. Okay, at this time I'm going to collect up three questions. Um, so we've got, because lots of hands go. Richard first, then Anil, then the, the gentleman to goes back. Richard. Yes, that's great. Uh, first, a question for Kayo, and that's, uh, sorry, Richard Portis, London Business School, um, competitor institution. Uh, <laughs> what can you do? Uh, I'm just making it clear. Uh, no, uh, question for Kayo, and that is about the private sector. Uh, one thing that seems to be happening, uh, to have been happening over the past couple of years, is um, a switch uh, against the private sector. And in particular, the numbers that I know uh, are the ones about credit and finance to the private sector. They seem to have been falling. And that is that a conscious policy? Is it a result of the political forces or what? Um, a question or comment to, uh, to Beata, and that is about fragmentation. Um, there's a lot of talk about fragmentation, but if you look at Penny Goldberg's paper for Brookings papers in, uh, uh, in April, um, the evidence that globalization is breaking down is pretty weak. Um, so um, there's a lot of talk, and of course the politics gets into that, but, um, but what's the real evidence that this is 
uh, that this is a major factor right now. Uh, and then there's the question of the role of the dollar and all that. And this comes back to KU too, um, that um, uh, the, um, the, the, the share of invoicing uh, in renminbi is really, I mean, it's, it's still very minor. Um, and the key to an international currency state is, is the financial markets and the, and the importance of it having a deep um, and, and, and broad financial market. China is not going to have that for a long time, is it or is it? Okay, ho hold those thoughts while Anil asks the question and then um, Richard, you pass it two rows back to the gentleman there. Anil. Okay, this is, um, I guess, maybe for Sergey. Uh, it's my sense that part of the reason Russia didn't crumble is they had two good technocratic central bank bankers there that decided to stick around. Um, and one of the things that's changed in China is they kind of left the central bank alone. I mean, they, they just had a very, very technocratic governor, and now he's been kind of walked the plank. And I, I wonder whether you think that the change in the leadership there is is a big threat or second order. Okay, if we you got care to say anything about Russia. I'd be curious to hear your take on that too. Well, I'll just hold you to the next round. Okay, we'll, we'll, let's go, Sergey Beata K. In response to those, so I'll take uh, I'll take the question on the central bank. I, I know these people. Some of them are my co-authors. Some of them are my students, and uh, uh, and it's uh, really shameful. It's really a personal tragedy for me. I'm, I'm, I'm very serious. It's very emotional. And uh, they've not left. Uh, some, some, they all understand what's going on. Um, and, uh, and yes, you're right. Uh, they really uh, stopped this panic, which, which did, uh, did uh, start uh, right, after, right after these unprecedented sanctions on the Russian Central Bank, which happened on the third day of the war. I, I was also part of the conversation between uh, certain analysts and some actual finance ministers from G7 countries. And I didn't expect that to happen. Uh, imagine that you impose sanctions on hundreds of billions of dollars of reserves. Is that possible? Then it turned out it to be possible. So the panic started, they closed down the Russian markets, currency market, stock market, panic was going on and they managed to contain it. And that was done uh, uh, with the support of repression apparatus, right? When when they freeze your dollar uh, dollar deposits, maybe you would protest, but with the uh, right police beating you up, maybe you stay at home still. Uh, so it's not just the central bank; it's also the right police. But uh, but overall, you're right. And uh, the reason they uh, put Putin always protected the independence of Russian central bank and finance ministry is that Putin uh, remembers 1990s, 1998 meltdown. And also for him, there is a humiliation to go borrow from IMF, right? And so he thought that uh, I let KGB people expropriate private sector, that's okay. But uh, macroeconomic stability is too bad, uh, too important to let it go. And so he let these technocrats take care of uh, financial stability. Uh, there is a big uh, counterexample, which is Turkey. Only now we have more reasonable people being appointed, but before that, Erdogan kept, kept saying, you IMF, you IBRD, uh, don't understand anything about macroeconomics. To fight inflation, we need to lower interest rates <laughs> because production will pick up and so prices will go down, right? That's very easy. And uh, I hope that's not what you teach to your students. <laughs> but, um, but, and we saw, like in a textbook, that uh, once you uh, once you kick out, I think three central bankers in a row. Four, four. Uh, four uh, the fourth is uh, fourth was was yeah. kicked out after 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 my my part my my job in Inverdi. Uh but uh, it's under your watch. Uh, but uh, <laughs> but you see inflation getting out of control. Lira is now ten times less valuable than it was uh, whatever fifteen years ago, and so and so this is something that you can learn from and Putin. Learn that Erdogan only now seems to start learning that. So uh, dictators have learned a lot of stuff. And uh, when we talk about, for example, about populists, very few populists now do what they did in 20th century in Latin America. Although I would say, wait for new Argentinian president. <laughs> <laughs> Beata. 
actually, when it comes to macroeconomic policy, Russia and Turkey are mirror images, right? Because in Russia, it was all about prioritizing macroeconomic stability at the cost of growth. While in Turkey, it was all about prioritizing growth at the cost of macroeconomic stability. So I think these were sort of conscious policies of different strategies. But coming to Richard's question, uh, indeed, you don't see deglobalization in trade statistics, right? So you may argue that trade in goods has peaked, but we see big increase uh, in trade in services, higher value services. But what has changed is the drivers of trade, while before, or trade policy actually, right? Before trade policy, was driven by commercial interest, economic interest. Now it is about geopolitics. And I think this is the shift. So we don't see it in trade statistics yet. We see it a little bit when you look at, you know, imports of uh, US firms. So you see that the share of um, imports at the firm level, at the firm product level, you see that share of goods sourced from China is going down. There is more source from Mexico, uh, Vietnam. Um, you see that unit value, so the cost of sourcing is going up. But but these are small changes. We, I think the process has started, but it's not visible yet. On currency, you're absolutely right. These are small shares of um, global trade that are uh, invoiced in national, you know, in yuan as, as a vehicle currency. But I think what matters is trade, is the trend. And I think that sanctions have created powerful incentive to start using alternative currencies. And also, you know, when you listen to what BRIC countries are talking about, you know, they actively want to promote usage of their national currencies in trade. So, you know, these are small things um, that potentially could, um, become bigger trends. Okay. Um, the uh, discrimination uh, towards the private sector is an implicit discrimination. It's because of institutional constraints, the financial system, the banks, the layers and layers of inter intermediaries that by the time you get to the private sector in the real economy, they're facing double digit real cost of capital and so forth, as opposed to state owned enterprises. But that is very different to interpret that, to say that the state is actually suppressing the private sector as much in the West has been talking about is a fundamental uh, mis misunderstanding because in fact, the state needs desperately the private sector. 90% of you know, employment and you know, these numbers are provided by the private sector. And recently um, they've put out a slew of policies, although ineffective, but the attitude is support of the private sector you know, opening up and let them have more opportunities. The regulatory crackdowns that occurred from big tech to education sector to financial system, now to healthcare, is kind of, they cleaned up the system and now they're like Jack Ma's back, you know, that kind of thing. And so I think, um, but the real issue, as you pointed out, is in the financial system, and, but I, that's an implicit discrimination. And then finally on the, on the RMB, I totally agree with you. It's about the financial depth, uh, liquidity and breadth. And plus the fact that China has capital controls, you know, non-convertibility, that really makes the RMB not so attractive. But I also say that we don't really know what the future is, especially because of that very strong BRICS or, uh, you know, other uh, desire to have that parallel system. And whether it's through trade or other uh, uh, parts, potentially RMB can, you know, increase by, and, and we were talking about expert panel views. I, I don't know where the statistic came from, but recent one says 40% ex expect that RMB will play a leading reserve currency in the next 25 years. <laughs> Are we on that? <laughs> <Look it up. laughs> Can I just follow up on this? Uh, because there is a natural experiment we observe right now. Indeed, uh, uh, Russia wants to sell its uh, hydro hydrocarbons uh, invoiced in non-dollar currencies, right? And so we actually see that yuan is, even with all the capital controls, yuan is pretty convertible compared to rupee. And Russia is now stuck with about uh, different estimates, 30 to 40 um, billion dollars in rupees, and it doesn't know what to do about it. And this is, this is actually quite a challenge. And when we talk about BRICS trying to launch its own currency, that conversation already started 15 years ago. Um, but uh, I think the only feasible uh, uh, route is actually internationalization of free media. And I think, uh, I think, I think BRICS, 
currency will be yuan if there'll be one. We're running a little bit over, but we started late. So I have a last round of questions. This gentleman here, was there a last question up at the back? There's a fellow right at the back there. If you... Okay, you go ahead. Hello, thank you. Uh, my name is Ayush uh, and I'm a current MBA student here. So my question is about the democracies that uh, Professor Sergey talked about. Do you think given the G20 status that happened in India and the Canadian crisis with India that is going on geopolitically, the democratic West as we know of is trying to politically recognize the non-democratic East and economically woo them just because she has the market? Or is there something more fundamental going on there where the five eyes didn't comment on Canadian prime minister's comment on, on Indian uh, problem that happened? And if that happens, how much do sanctions play a role with technological advancement that China was seeing with seven nanometers and ASML being banned by, by Netherlands? Uh, despite having all the resources, if ASML cannot provide the technology, you cannot make 18 angstrom chips that Intel is trying to make. So there's some, some problem out there, right? So hold, hold that for one. Take the last question at the, at the back. Uh, hi, uh, Matthew Oxenford, uh, Economist Intelligence Unit. Um, so um, I was curious about a comment Sergey made about the green transition and how Germany moving off of Russian gas and oil um, in record time could be an example of this. This was largely done with significant uh, disruption to the industrial sector and the outsourcing of a lot of industries that have largely become uncompetitive in Europe. So I'm kind of curious to talk about the green transition, the panel's thoughts for the green transition on the producer side. Is there just going to be a huge decrease in industrial production globally? Is this going to be uh, see more movement of uh, industrial production to areas that have less stringent environmental regulation? And also seeing as the CBAM reporting requirements have just started this week, um, how is that going to potentially be a countervailing force in that, uh, in that arena? Thank you. Right, let's let's use this for last comments to take up those questions. So we'll go in order: Beata, Sergey, then finally Kay. Uh, le let me comment on the adjustment of European industry to higher gas pr prices. Um, in our latest regional economic prospects, we did a decomposition. So Europe dropped its usage of natural gas by twenty-one percent. About a quarter of the drop was attributable to milder winter, so less need for heating. About a quarter was due to lower than expected industrial output. And you know, a big chunk, so less than, a, not quite half, but a big chunk was attributable to changes in the industrial output. So essentially you saw lower output in gas intensive industries, such as chemicals or production of bricks or basic metals and increase in automotive industry and pharma. Um, and it seems that that was due to some spare capacity being in those less gas intensive industries. So there haven't been flows of labor between sectors, right? So it was sort of a temporary <clears throat> adjustment rather than permanent shift in the composition of industries. Okay. Yes, uh, let me follow up on this. I was very much part of this uh, the policy debate uh, in March uh, 2022 when uh, my, uh, my, well, all leading German uh, um, economists wrote a paper about what is going to happen when Germany stops importing Russian gas. The paper was called What If? And then I would just want to cheer up the economist colleagues in the room. The chancellor of Germany said, it's going to be a massive recession. It's not going to be good. What you're saying that recession will be from 0.2% GDP decline to 3% GDP decline. It's not possible because your models are just models. And I talk to business people and they tell me we will suffer a lot, right? And of course, we see what's happened. Germany doesn't consume Russian gas anymore. And recession, if there is a recession, it's very, very much. And uh, the reason for that is exactly what Beata was talking about. And this is what these people said. There is elasticity of substitution. Some industries will produce less, some industries will produce more. And this is how, how economics works. And uh, I think, I think uh, uh, that, that also creates some uh, um, uh, ground uh, for optimism. And sometimes economists uh, get things right, um, <laughs> including on green transition. And so, and so yeah, whether, whether we should be fearing deindustrialization or not, well, uh, uh, Kay mentioned that 
process of development is about services, uh, about uh, high value added services. And uh, in uh, developed countries, industry plays indeed plays a much less important role than uh, in middle income countries and low income countries and in the Western countries when they were uh, less uh, developed. So this is completely normal and natural. And actually German plan for industrial, for, 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 for green transition was to pay off coal workers and coal uh, producing communities to not to produce coal. And the costs involved were humongous. So the amounts that Germany wanted to pay coal workers coal miners to stop producing coal, to, uh, to move away from coal were just, were, were just huge, but that was part of the plan. Uh, get rid of certain, certain, certain industries. So this is, this is, again, this is completely, completely normal. On India, so as I said, there are political scientists who be believe that India is already not a democracy, but this is a bit like uh, going back to uh, Cold War. When you have Cold War, you need to make your choices. And this is what our book is talking about. So before the uh, uh, fall of Berlin Wall, uh, the US, would, US, the West, Western public would uh, uh, close their eyes on certain anti-communist brutal dictators. It was okay, right? So uh, after, uh, after uh, the fall of the Soviet system, Suddenly, there was no existential threat, so you don't need to choose the lesser evil. You could actually say, even if you're against communism, you should not violate human rights. And this has created this feeling of end of history, the victory of liberal model, and so on. Now we are back to this, uh, this, uh, this setting where you have enemy number one, and whoever is enemy of your enemies, by definition, your friend. And so we see, we already saw that with allies on the war war of, on terror. Saudi Arabia is not a democracy. I'm sorry. Uh, and, uh, and then I think the same logic will apply to India. India is invited to summits of democracy. And even if India kills uh, people abroad, like Saudi Arabia does, uh, I think the logic of US-China uh, Cold War will apply to uh, allies in this particular Cold War even if India is becoming less and less free and uh, free, free country. Okay, final thoughts from you. Uh, the, the falling of the technological iron curtain is going to produce a lot of unintended consequences. <laughs> and we just don't know what's going to happen. Uh, I think in the short term, it's going to enrich a lot of the intermediaries selling these equipment. And even with China with secondhand equipment, maybe not the most advanced, there are lots and lots of companies in China coming up with alternative chip design features and functions to circumvent these restrictions and potentially will be successful even with just domestic capacity. Great, we need to wrap it up there, but we can carry on the conversation uh, over drinks. It's gonna be a reception up on the first floor to which you are all invited. I um, need to thank the Chicago Booth for hosting us and the Clark Center for Global Markets at uh, Booth in, um, in Chicago for uh, partnership, sponsorship of this event. Um, and Neil, the, the next, next event here is on the 30th of November, which I think will be the last event as part of the celebration of the 125th anniversary of Chicago Booth. And that will be a conversation between uh, Anil Kashyap and uh, Zani Minton Beddoes, who's the editor in chief of The Economist. That'll be a fireside chat on 30th of November when it will probably be a bit colder and we'll need to be around a fire. Um, <laughs> so what is the last thing I need to say? I think I need to say thank you very much to all of you for, uh, for coming along. Thank you, thank you very much.